Um, well, my name is Paul Elkhorst. I'm the editor in chief of Spatial Economic Analysis. And the speakers of today are uh, Professor Manfred Lenzen and Dr. Mengu Lee. Pro Manfred Lenzen is Professor of Sustainable sustainability research at the University of uh, Sydney. And he has contributed to major, to important major methodological advances and numer numerous applications of input output analysis to global environmental uh, problems. This keynote is about input output and disaster analysis. And the title is a minimum disruption approach to input output disaster analysis. He's not presenting this research on its own, but together with Dr. Mengu Lee, who's also affiliated to the University of Sydney. And the reason is that they both contributed to this uh, research. Professor Manfred Lenson is editor in chief of the journal, e journal Economic Systems Research, which is the official journal of the International Input Output Association. But what perhaps not everyone knows is that the Journal of Spatial Economic Analysis, of which I'm editor-in-chief, also publishes papers applying input-output analysis or focusing on environmental problems. Uh, I counted the number of input-output studies that appeared in this journal over the last few years, and I came to a number of eight. And last year, in 2020, we also published a special issue on uh, climate change. Now, through this keynote, we hope that more researchers will discover that spatial economic analysis is a potential outlet for their research. And now I want to give the floor to Manfred Lenz. Um, hello, everyone. Um, good evening from Australia and good morning to wherever you are or midday. Um, uh, thank you, Paul, for the uh, kind introduction. Um, also, thank you, uh, Paul and the roommate, um, to uh, to give us to give uh, Mengu and, and, and I the opportunity to present to you today. I'm waiting for the first slide. Thank you, Mengu. So, um, the title, as it was already uh, mentioned, is a minimum disruption approach to disaster analysis. And my name is Manfred Lenson, and um, I am joined by my my colleague, uh, Dr. Ming Yu Li. Next, I should acknowledge our co-authors in this work. Um, uh, this is um, Luis Pedalga from the University of Leon in Spain. And uh, our Nima Malik is also a colleague of ours from the University of Sydney in Australia. Next. Quick overview of how um, uh, this, this uh, uh, annual lecture unfolds. So I will, I will start. I will give you an overview of a disaster analysis. I will then introduce to you the minimum disruption principle and explain our case study because um, we actually applied our research to the country of Venezuela. Then Mengu is going to take over and um, explain in more detail the minimum disruption approach to disaster analysis. And then she will present to you our results for this case study of Venezuela and also discuss some of these results. And um, if we all finish in time, we should have uh, plenty of time for questions and answers. So disaster analysis. Um, I chose this, this slide um, just to, to signal to you that in Australia, people are now because um, we had um, a horrendous fire season um, uh, a bit less than, than two years ago. You might have seen this in the news. Um, about three quarters of the forests of the East Coast of Australia have, have burned. Um, a quite intensive, uh, partly the blazes with uh, fires propagating at the crown level. And 
so you've seen this in the news, Ming Yu and I were here for this, and I can tell you um, many, many, many days with orange skies. Yeah, uh, one o'clock at midday, the sun being orange to red in the middle of the sky. Um, uh, it smelled like a campfire and uh, ash in the sky, burnt leaves sailing down, and there'd be uh, just no end in sight. These fires have had an impact on our economy, not just through uh, lost uh, uh, employment, but also uh, uh, otherwise. So since then, I think this has been etched in your Australian psyche now. The next one. Um, but of course, you can come up with uh, another very prominent disaster that's, that's uh, not restricted to Australia. And that's of course the global pandemic. And uh, you see here, I've, I've tried to come up with a few examples of an analysis of, of, of these disasters and for the, for the coronavirus pandemic, that's a, that's a paper that appeared in Nature Human Behavior, as you can see with the screenshot to, to the right. Um, and there've been many more on that topic. Uh, it was quite, quite, quite popular. Uh, next one. So um, earthquakes, this is a study from Japan on the uh, great Kobe earthquakes. Now disaster analysis is quite um, widespread in Japan. And a lot of studies are on earthquakes. Well, you can guess why, because Japan is situated on the Pacific ring of, of fire and um, it is earthquake prone. Like, uh, 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 but every now and then, as you see here, if the earthquake is a very large one, as in Kobe, uh, you have massive destruction. So um, the frequency of, of these events in Japan means uh, that the, is, um, the discipline of disaster analysis is, is quite well known, and there's many scholars engaged in this. Next one. Um, well, the disaster analysis, uh, an overview would not be complete without speaking about climate change. Um, here is a, a study that uh, we've done uh, in Australia. You see the coastline here. And this, um, this weather system that you can see on the picture is Cyclone Debbie that made landfall in, in northern Queensland and led to widespread rain, uh, heavy winds and floods. Uh, significant damage, not just in Queensland, uh, but also in northern New South Wales. Next one. Talking about uh, floods, um, uh, this is the uh, picture of the Christmas flood in York uh, in the United Kingdom. And you see uh, there's, there's a, a paper uh, published by, um, by um, uh, with Eric Dietzenbacher, who is, the, who is my predecessor as an editor for economic systems research. So this goes to show um, uh, that disaster analysis is, is a topic that uh, appears in, in, in this journal. And um, just to uh, recapitulate on what Paul said, um, the screenshot um, on, the, uh, on the lower right is, uh, is the, of an article that appeared in Spatial Economic Analysis. Um, it's one of the articles that probably that Paul has counted in his, um, in his tally. And it's on uh, on on floods in Germany. The next one. Um, perhaps I'll finish my overview with um, perhaps an unusual um, kind of disaster, and that's a space weather. For those who do not know what uh, space weather is, um, this is um, an electromagnetic storm. The cause of this storm is um, enhanced solar activity. Uh, you might have seen pictures of the sun and the, and the intensity uh, of, of the sun uh, varies quite a lot. And if there are periods of, of, um, of intense activity, um, then also the uh, charged radiation from the sun uh, that's, that's, that's being sent out increases intensity. And because these particles are charged, once they reach Earth, they're being deflected so it's into the northern and the southern hemisphere. And um, in, in normal use, you can see them um, as, uh, as, as northern lights, 
yeah, but if the intensity gets pretty bad, they become an electromagnetic storm. And um, there was an event at the beginning of the 20th century in the US, that's the Carrington event where they had an electromagnetic storm. And just, just to let you know what happens when uh, yeah, uh, it induces fields in everything, basically everything that's, that's magnetic and that are electric uh, conductors. So during, the, during this storm in the US, the beginning of 20th century, they had sparking from telegraph lines. Just imagine this, you just walk across the footpath and it's this telegraph line just three, four meters high and it sparks to the ground. That's what happens. And it was so bad that lots of quite a large uh, part of some because of these fires. If an electromagnetic storm of that magnitude happened today, all our telecommunication systems, uh, a lot of power equipment, for example, transformers, and would be damaged, and there would be um, widespread ripple effects because international trade would be disrupted. You know? So, and um, this leads me to describing uh, the basic approach. So next slide. And that's all the papers that I've showed you on the, on the right, so the screenshots, they have one thing in common. They use input output analysis and apply it to disasters. So input output models, just a, just a primer for, for those who are, uh, who may be coming to this uh, unprepared. Input output databases um, have existed for uh, since the staff uh, just uh, so Vasily Leontief, he got a Nobel Prize for, for his um, uh, discoveries and for his development. And today, more than 100 countries around the world issue input output databases regularly. And each of those databases is standardized to UN standards. Now they're all designed in the same form of shape, which makes it incredibly convenient to use them. And they consist of three matrices. That's T, that's intermediate demand. That's basically what industries trade with each other. Y on the right is final demand. This is what industries um, sell to households, government, and the capital sector where it then stops. And there's V, that's value added. That's what these entities, households and so on, input into industries. An example here is transactions. For example, if uh, um, a, uh, a steel and, and uh, metal equipment uh, sector sells machinery to um, uh, an extractive business that is uh, input in the T matrix and you see a T72. If a steel or a steel equipment sector um, uh, sells, let's say, hand tools, or, or no, let's say this capital, uh, sells an oil rig, yeah, uh, to, uh, that is not something that you use every year, that's a capital item, uh, that's a capital investment and then appears in the Y block. And then if the government, government taxes or subsidizes this mining sector, that appears in the V block. So you can see there's all kinds of transactions in an input output table. Most importantly, I highlight this now, there's the interdependencies between all sectors of an economy are mapped and represented in an input output database. And that lets us uh, address ripple effects, you know, spillover effects that cascade through the economy, the national economy or the world economy. Okay, next one. Okay, next one. Yeah, thank you. Um, so um, just to highlight um, two features, of an input output system because they uh, will become important through the rest of the talk. Um, this, this blue box on the right uh, and the blue boxes on the top, they show you the input output balance. It's an accounting system, so it must be balanced. If you um, sum across the rows for any one column, you sum, thank you, Mayor, uh, you sum uh, uh, intermediate inputs and uh, value added, and that must equal the sum across columns for any one row, which is the sum of intermediate outputs and the outputs into final demand. So total input must equal total output. That's an important feature and that must hold 
in an economy that is in an equilibrium state. Second feature is what we call the A matrix. So you mentioned this T matrix. Yeah, these are absolute figures, these are dollar figures. Yeah. Yeah, it is to show you what one industry inputs into the other in, in values of US dollars. If you divide this by total output, yeah, then you get coefficients. So, so many dollars of input per dollar of output. That's like, uh, it's like a recipe, you know, you need 500 grams of flour for a one kilogram cake, that sort of thing. And because this is an economy, it's called the production recipe. In the course of this talk, we will talk about the production recipe um, a few times. So I uh, um, encourage you to keep these two things in mind, the input output accounting balance and the production recipe, which, which is derived from the input output matrix. Next, thank you. So problem, so why, basically the next three slides are about why did we engage in the work that we present to you today. There have been input output based disaster methods uh, before. There's plenty of those, you know? But um, there are a few problems in some of them. And they're not under, just identified by us, or also by others, you know? It's, 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 it's known, they're known problems. For example, here, uh, Bert Stegen uh, from Netherlands and Maria Boczkajowa, uh, they've published this nice paper about imbalances in, in post-disaster economies. Um, the problem that their method had was that when the production loss uh, is true disaster, the, 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 the damages, when they're larger than total final demand, uh, that led to situations of negative final demand. And of course, you can't explain this because um, if you have Negative, well, in, in, a, in a national sense, you can, because if you have neg negative final demand, it just means that you need assistance from outside, yeah, from another country. But if you have negative final demand in the global economy, it just doesn't make sense because, you know, there, there are no billions from banks you can bail us out. If, yeah, just, so that is just a nonsensical feature and it needs to be fixed for a global model. The other problem that they had was um, that the production recipe, just remember this A matrix, was fixed, was constant, the constant coefficients. So that means whatever damage you assert on, on, on one point, it cascades through the entire economy because every input is deemed essential. There's constant coefficients. If one input goes down, now let's say a glass into automotive, in, into vehicle manufacturing, you can't make vehicles with less glass and the same input of all other uh, uh, materials like rubber. You know, if you have less glass, then you can't use the rubber that you have. You also need to use less rubber. But see, their, their principle um, also held spatially. And Mengu is gonna show you later on, on what that means and how we relax this. Next one. So there's uh, uh, Jan Osterhaven and my Baumeister. Uh, they pointed to another set of problems in, in these previous methods. Uh, again, uh, that's what I alluded to, these fixed input coefficients, this fixed production recipe. In a multi-regional model that is spatially explicit, this means that you have fixed trade origin coefficients that you say, well, you shall always import that percentage from Germany or from France but there's no reason why this should be because products are substitutes. Again, Mengu is gonna show you uh, some real implications of uh, this, this assumption and relaxing it. Um, and then finally, there are a few other things. Um, previous methods like Albert Stengel's method, there was only suitable to a drop in final demand. So you can only ever turn the screw onto final demand, but there was no provision uh, to also let intermediate demand be affected by a disaster. And consequently, uh, you couldn't assess downstream impacts because you can only ever um, use Leon Chief's demand pool uh, model and, and just uh, uh, affect the final demand. So that these, these were the issues that then led us to think about what we could improve. Next one. So 
uh, our approach then, uh, we followed, we, we took uh, 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 Osterhavens and, and Baumeister's critique to heart and thought, well, because they, they, they said, and that's, that's, uh, that's uh, verbatim here um, uh, quoted, that both firms and households in the short run after a disaster, tried to stick as much as possible to their old patterns of sales and purchases. One, and two, that other firms will step in to replace losses and may experience positive impacts to the technical or spatial substitution effects. So we thought, okay, let's take Bert Stinger's method and enable to all patterns and enable spatial substitution. Now, um, these two authors have done that too, but they've used, um, uh, as a as a as a um, an optimization function, a minimum information gain function, and I won't dwell on it, but just to say as much that this function um, has singularities. It's not very well behaved, and and um, so in the next slide, I'm going to show you what we chose instead. So. Again, our aim is a minimum disruption approach. I will define this in an, uh, very soon. So that captures the entire economy, not just final demand. That allows substitution. And then the third innovation. The third innovation, we say, well, these transaction in the input output matrix, they're not all the same. Yeah, they're surely there are some that are more important than others. Think about, um, uh, also, and think about um, uh, food, you know, supermarkets. We saw this during the coronavirus pandemic, you know, at least in Australia, when we had lockdowns, retail was closed, but supermarkets were not, and, 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 and pharmacies were not, and hospitals, of course, were not shut down. So when a disaster strikes, surely some sectors I asked to undergo very minimal or very small changes or disruptions like uh, medical services. And some are allowed maybe uh, bigger disruptions. And so we wanted to accommodate this obvious and natural uh, circumstance by introducing priority weights. Mengi will explain this later on. So next slide. Minimum disruption is not a, a principle that we invented. John Proops in uh, 1983 was the first one, to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe, uh, introduced the minimum disruption principle. And then in Australia, at least uh, by uh, Cornwall and Treaty, this was taken up to um, assess the impact of environmental taxes on economic welfare. Next slide. So here's John Proops. Um, or John Creedy's uh, definition. Yeah? A disruption to any variable, Z, say, uh, in industry I, is measured in terms of a proportional change in that variable. So it's a change in that variable. In specifying an objective function that is for optimization, that is a measure of aggregate disruption, Proops adopted a quadratic cost function. Many will introduce this later on. However, it is useful to consider the most general form, and that's the most general form where you have um, uh, an exponent, uh, a theta. So Z dot is delta Z, that is post-disaster minus pre-disaster. Okay, that's delta Z in any variable. And then to the power of theta. So what probes has done, and we follow probes, is theta equals two. Okay, so we use the function. Now, also the half approach. Okay, next one. Okay, our case study. That's my last bit. I think I should be in time. Yes. Our case study. You all know where Venezuela is situated. It's uh, north of South America. Next one. So, um, so Venezuela has gone through um, quite a hard, uh, a hard time recently. And that hard time started with uh, our oil products by plunge in uh, 2014. Now you can see that in the diagram to your, to the right of this photo. Um, this photo is of uh, PDVSA, that is uh, Venezuela's state-owned uh, oil 
oil manufacturer. You know, so uh, Venezuela is, a, is, is heavily dependent on, on oil exports and uh, derives its major revenue from, from this commodity. And when the oil, oil prices slumped, uh, you can imagine that hit the uh, Venezuelan economy hard. Expressively you know, half or to less than half. Uh, but interestingly, I mentioned this right now because it also comes up later throughout the talk. Um, it still kept up its export to its allies, being Cuba and Nicaragua, for example. Anyway, just want to mention this now. Keep it in mind because it will appear later on in the English results. The other thing I'd like you to keep in mind is that color, that yellow color, because we have five aspects of Venezuela's case study. And we use these, these, these colors throughout the talk as a visual reminder of you, just where we are in the talk and what that relates to. And we'll also show that picture here so that you have a visual reminder of what it is that, that we're talking about. Okay, next slide. Um, of course, you can imagine being oil shortages means refining shortages. Yeah, uh, uh, the decreased the crude oil production means decreased refining production, and that led to petrol shortages and the, to long queues at the bowsers in, in everywhere in Venezuela. So keep in mind the red square, that's when we talk about petrol. Anything red that results, petrol shortages. Why did they come about? Next one. Orange. It also led to food shortages. Now, that's not directly resultant like the refining story out of crude oil, but more indirectly. You know, it, it goes through the supply chain network, and that's where input output analysis comes in. That's where it's so good. You know, it maps all these supply chains and these interlinkages and um, Mengu will, will talk about this in this particular one, but orange food shortages, you can see the photo here. Yeah, it's, uh, it was quite, quite severe. Um, yeah, next slide. Um, the Venezuelan government tried to intervene by freezing food prices, you know, um, and that led, of course, to food producers, <laughs> their, their revenue uh, was, was slashed because they couldn't ask uh, market prices, it was hyperinflation going on, and they were, their revenues were cut short. So what happened instead is that a lot of food actually got, well, illegally so, sold across the border to Colombia. Yeah, and we pick up on this effect, we tried, you know, uh, with this disaster and, and supply chain situation, can we actually see this effect in our simulation? That's green, you know, green, green uh, aspect of our case study. And last one. Um, now this has got nothing to do with oil, but unfortunately, simultaneously, there was a drought in Venezuela. And, and, the, and this dam is the uh, Caroni uh, Dam in the South Venezuela is heavily reliant on hydropower. And um, the drought meant that uh, dam levels were low and that uh, you can see the diagram in the bottom right that um, a hydropower uh, hydropower output uh, slumped, and then in this picture here, and that happened at the same time. And we also modeled modeled this one, yeah. And um, and this is blue. Next one. And next slide. And herewith, I hand over to Meng Yu. It's all yours. Thank you, Manfred. And um, so I'll do a very brief self introduction. I am Mayu Lee, and I am now working as a postdoc researcher at Mapper's Group. And I realize probably today's internet is a bit unstable. So please forgive us. We are very far away from you. <laughs> so now, continue from what Manfred has covered regarding the research background. So, in the following, I am going to talk about two things. Firstly, um, I'm going to describe our minimum disruption method. And then uh, I will show how we apply this method by uh, combining the Venezuela case study just as mentioned by Manfred. So I'll start with a general introduction of an integrated disaster impact model. And such a general model could be broken down into three 
general components. And firstly, we might need to know how the current economy works or the pre-disaster economy works. And this can be regarded as our business as usual scenario. And then we also need to model the disaster itself. And that means um, we need certain qualifications to capture the direct production losses due to the disaster. And then by combining um, the disaster itself with the pre-disaster operating economy, we can then make certain predictions, for example, about uh, uh, some possible um, operations of post-disaster economy. So those are three general steps, and let's see how each um, step could be established. So for describing a balanced pre-disaster economy, essentially various economic models could be employed here. And just as mentioned by Manfred, we are using the input of model to capture transactions between different sectors at different regions within a given economy. So keyword here is multi-regional input model, which is adopted in our minimum disruption approach. And accordingly, if it is a balanced economy, and here we only assume it is a balanced economy, following what Manfred has mentioned, this equilibrium equation would exist. And it tells us um, the total output of the economy equals the total input of the economy. So the following general step would be uh, to model the disaster event itself. And um, if you still remember this paper mentioned by Manfred. So here we follow uh, what the authors established here in terms of um, so-called event metrics. And uh, this event matrix aims to record production capacity losses um, that um, uh, specifically for sectors at different regions, they um, receive certain um, losses due to the direct heat of the disaster. So here's an example. So imagine here, this uh, left map, shows the spatial distribution of different sectors in the pre-disaster economy. And here, different size of the dot indicates um, the different uh, size of the production output for those sectors. And imagine now, um, we have a disaster. We have a flood hit this economy. And specifically, this flood hit only parts of this economy represented by the um, shaded grain area in this uh, right-hand side map. And clearly we can see that um, um, immediately after the disaster, those gray area sectors, those dots within the gray area, they receive the uh, losses in a direct way in just right after the disaster. And here we introduce the parameter gamma here or here to indicate the fractional losses of the production happened only for those great area sectors. And if we obtain such fractional losses for all the sectors that receive the direct heat of the economy, we come up with this so-called invent matrix here. And here, um, once we establish this, um, event matrix, we are able to estimate um, the potential maximum production after a disaster. And this is denoted by X tilde, which equals one minus gamma, which represents um, the percentage of what has been left um, for, for the whole economy after the disaster. So here is a percentage showing what has been left. And multiplied by x0, here represents um, the pre-disaster total output. So as a conclusion here, we obtain x tilde, um, which can be regarded as upper limits um, for the post-disaster economy in terms of the total output. And um, 
to populate event metrics itself is often a more labor intensive process. It means we would need to do lots of searches and possible um, data sources could include, for example, government reports, NGO reports, online media, academic journal papers, government statements. So pretty much everything, every clue, every information that we could really find in order to populate such fractional loss or such gamma metrics. And that's the second step. And for the third, um, make prediction to obtain potential operating scenarios for the post disaster economy. And specifically here, we um, assume uh, the post disaster economy is in a balanced state. And um, so, yeah, so here the keyword is balanced. It means we are focused only the final balance status of the post disaster economy, but not really the transition path of reaching it. And, and accordingly, because it is a balanced economy, we again have this equilibrium equation holds. So let's summarize the main aspects of the three general steps. At the very first step, we have our pre-disaster balanced economy, where we have four I.O. parameters. I.O. means input-output parameters to describe this whole economy. And um, so those parameters can easily be obtained from a given input-output table. So it means all those parameters here, listed here, they are known to us. And then if we are able to establish our gamma metrics, our event metrics, then because X zero is known, we can easily estimate X tilde, which represents the potential maximum production after disaster. So it means for the first two steps, everything is known to us. And then for the post disaster balanced economy, again, we have those four parameters for IO describing variables. And at this stage, we only know equilibrium equation, but we don't know their values. We don't know any combination of them, which means those four, they can be considered as decision variables. And here, because they are decision variables, we need a way to um, estimate their values and therefore, that's why we propose this method, this minimum disruption method to predict possible values, possible combinations of our post disaster economy. So here is a key uh, innovation where um, actually it's the first time that we include the whole economy as decision variables, just as mentioned by Manfred. Um, previous studies, they um, generally would only include X and Y as decision variables in their models. But this time, we keep the entire economy as decision variables. That's including uh, upstream and downstream supply chains. And so um, here we are entering into a stage to determine our design variables. And this process can be formulated um, as an optimization problem. So very first step, we need our objective function. And from the title here, you already know, um, it's the minimum disruption method, which means we aim to minimize disruptions of the economy, or if we use plain words, it means we want to minimize the distance between pre and post disaster economies. And here by saying disruption, again, it uh, corresponds to what Manfred just mentioned. Um, um, actually here, um, it, it, it refers to um, that, um, so economic actors, they try to maintain their pre-disaster pattern of transactions. And that's actually uh, sort of the definition of disruption. And in terms of the expression, again, as mentioned by Manfred, here is a general form. And we make theta into two 
which means our objective function now follows quadratic form here. And so if we look into this objective function, we have S tilde here representing our post-disaster economy. And of course, it is composed of the four decision variables. And um, here um, it aims, actually we aim to um, let our post-disaster economy S tilde as close as possible to the pre-disaster economy. And here also is subject to penalty weights. And this objective function involves two key innovations. So in addition to uh, just mentioned where we have whole economy as decision variables, another key information is that by actually here introducing the decision variables, um, uh, the decision weights for all the transactions within the post disaster economy, we are able to implement the decision pri priorities to different transactions when moving to the post disaster equilibrium. And here, how to understand those um, so called decision uh, priorities? So um, we can understand it as um, the flexibility of the transactions. For example, uh, transactions relating to, as mentioned by Manfred again, uh, uh, to domestic food, water, and energy supply or um, health services. We argue that those are actually inflexible transactions. So it means if they are really affected or altered because of the disaster, then there would be significant social disruption um, that might be caused uh, due, due to such change of those transactions. So, so, that, so that means if we put a higher priority weights over those uh, inflexible transactions, we mean those inflexible transactions should not be altered too much due to the disaster. And here, um, minimizing such disruption also subjects to the following five constraints. The first one, if you still remember uh, or recall X tilde, that is when we uh, establish our uh, event matrix gamma, and we estimate the potential maximum production after disaster. And here we require our post disaster total output to be bound by X tilde. So that's our very first constraint. And secondly, um, we know it is a balanced economy and we have this equilibrium equation. The third one actually is relating to trade balance. And this one corresponds to what was mentioned um, in the problems like that. Um, so in line with Wusthofen et al, they described in their paper that trade balance actually needs to be guaranteed when moving to the post-disaster equilibrium. And this means for a specific region, for a specific country, they may not be able to um, alter their trade surplus or deficit condition within a very short period of time just after the disaster. So that's our third country. And the fourth one is aiming to say all input out transactions shall be non-negative. And again, um, this one also corresponds to Manfred's previous slide where um, negative final demand could occur. Uh, if uh, certain IO disaster models uh, applied, for example, um, in the study by Sting et al., uh, they uh, like if using the um, models, sometimes we do occur final demand. So um, here is actually a constraint to say um, to avoid such situation. And the, the last constraint here is that we allow input substitution. So in previous input output disaster methods as summarized by Manfred, um, where the, if you still recall, the production recipe matrix A is often assumed to be constant before and after a disaster. 
And it means um, essentially no input substitution is allowed. And this is often regarded as sort of the limitations of input output disaster models. And here as a um, key innovation in our method, we relax this constant assumption um, by allowing products or inputs substitution. So it means that, um, for example, we have, um, so we, we, we provide flex flexibility, for example, for a specific input into a sector in a region. And we argue that this input could actually be replaced by an exactly same product, but in different regions. So, um, yep, so it means it, uh, certain regions, they can really increase the import from other regions to compensate the losses from the import uh, from the specific region. So that's our, our five constraint here. And um, so, so here coming to the stage where we are going to apply some values, some numbers to um, to really simulate the Venezuela case study. And for the pre-disaster economy, uh, we need related IO parameters. And they were actually obtained from the IE lab, which is short for Industrial Ecology Virtual Laboratory. And um, IE lab itself is a collaborative cloud-based research platform where um, a large scale uh, multi-regional input out table uh, could be compiled following users' preferences. And the IELAP was um, developed by Manfred and colleagues um, from ISA here at Sydney Uni. And such platform has been developed for different regions around the world. For example, we have IELAP Globe, IELAP Australia, China, Indonesia, Japan, etc. So um, really depending on your um, study or your regional coverage, you would be able to um, obtain your tailored and flexible input out table out of those platforms. And specifically in our study here, we obtained our IO table from IELAB Global because it's a global study. So now entering into result section, and I am going to show you some of the results. Um, obtained by solving the mentioned minimum disruption model with Venezuela economic crisis as a case study. And first I'll uh, start with some main aspects uh, regarding the scenario settings. So in this work, um, the economy is a global one and it is composed of 11 regions that cover the world. And Given that our case study is relating to the global oil price plunge, so 11 regions cover important oil producers, for, for example, uh, Venezuela, and also other aggregated world regions. Um, they are distinguished by, for example, different um, income levels. So we do have developed countries. We do have developing countries. And uh, some regions, they, uh, they follow specific uh, geopolitical constellations, such as we distinguish the allies of Venezuela by aggregating regions such as Russia, such as uh, Turkey, Iran, Syria, etc. So those are our regional classification. And in terms of the sectoral classification, we distinguish 15 economic sectors that cover detailed, for example, food, petrol, crude oil, electricity, and other service related sectors. And so what is the aim of this study? Uh, here we aim to actually um, replicate the um, actual consequences resulting from Venezuela economic crisis. So if you still recall uh, what uh, was mentioned by Manfred that um, so such production fall in Venezuela leads to um, for example uh, oil price decline and droughts and then uh, those uh, 
finally uh, translate into Venezuela production shortfalls of, um, um, of crude oil production by 73.4%. And electricity generation by 26.5%. So those two are actually um, two fractional losses. And we uh, could establish our disaster event or gamma metrics accordingly based on the two percentages here. And this is our um, case study, our Venezuela case study. Um, and the next parameter we need in order to really calculate the objective function is decision weight matrix. And here we distribute um, decision weights according to different groups. So this means um, for transactions among different sectors and different regions, we apply um, different weights and different priorities. So if you still recall, um, high priority means that such transactions are inflexible to be altered during the disaster. And if we put a lower weight, it means those transactions are relatively flexible to be changed before and after a disaster. And here, the highest priority group goes to transactions of food, petrol, and electricity for Venezuela, uh, sorry, for, for rich countries, household and industry consumption. And here, rich countries include, for example, the EU, the North America, um, developed Asia and the um, Pacific, and OPEC. So that group defines our highest priority. Um, and it means those transactions are uh, very inflexible. Uh, and um, this setting actually reflects the geopolitical, uh, geopolitical realities where um, we, we, we all have a general sense that um, wealthy nations, they have higher ability to secure their essential supply chains. Therefore, um, they so those important uh, uh, sectors their transactions would be less uh, likely to change uh, or to alter to a great percentage just before and after a disaster and the the second highest priority group goes to venezuela exports to its allies and also the rich world's final demand and value added uh, for other sectors. And this is again in line with the realities where, where Venezuela's commitment to its trading partners exist so that those transactions, they are considered less flexible as well when facing the heat of the disaster. And of course, uh, other different priority groups also involve here. And I would like to mention this one, um, the lowest priority group. And um, they are relating to Venezuela's household um, final demand and salaries. And um, so if we compare this one with the, with the second highest group, we can see that um, those domestic transactions within of Venezuela, they are um, less weighted and less prioritized than exports. And actually, this is consistent with Venezuela's focus of um, using its export earnings to um, secure their inputs to, um, in, into production, um, comparing to really meeting the domestic final demand. And also, uh, Venezuela's supply of food to Colombia is also of lowest weight. And this setting reflects what Manfred mentioned, uh, where Venezuela government um, uh, sells food to neighboring Colombia to secure inputs. And um, so this transaction is assumed to be um, flexible to change when facing the disaster. So now 
all stars are alight and uh, we have all the parameters and values ready. So we would just need to solve the optimization problem by using the parameters we just established. And we could come up with certain predictions of which sectors at which regions they experience losses or gains from the Venezuela production shortfall. And here is the result graph. And it plots the absolute change of transactions for different sectors or regions. And here, um, the redder the color, then the higher the losses are. And then the darker the color, the higher the revenues are. And in terms of the transaction flow direction, row sectors to column sectors or from row regions to column regions. So this is the flow of the transaction. So that's some um, background information regarding the result growth, uh, graph. And here, if you still remember um, Manfred talking about background information regarding the Venezuela case study, where there are five colors uh, represent five major aspect of um, economic um, or uh, transaction uh, being influenced by the disaster. So those are what happened uh, in the real world. And let's see if we are able to replicate such consequences based on our for, um, pur proposed model here. So let's start with the collapse of oil uh, exports, which is denoted by the yellow color. And if we check the first row, um, we have red cells as denoted here. So those are red cells. And if you still remember the transaction flow direction, that is from uh, Venezuela to other regions. So they are relating to Venezuela export to specifically rich countries. And we clearly observe export losses. So, um, specifically, I can tell based on the background data that those losses are actually coming from, mainly coming from crude oil sector. And because we have that trade balance constraint, so we have export uh, losses. Accordingly, we also have, um, or we actually here we observe um, the import loss for Venezuela as well. And then think about this, uh, Venezuela now export less and import less. And then accordingly, we observe actually large um, losses uh, for Venezuela in terms of the uh, domestic transactions. And in general, those observations, um, they directly relates actually to the, uh, our priority weight settings. Because uh, we make Venezuela household salaries and final consumption of lowest priority, which means they are flexible to, um, to, to experience changes due to the uh, Venezuela production shortfalls. And here, in conclusion, uh, those sectors, those domestic transactions within Venezuela, they experience a very large um, uh, economic losses. And then, in contrast, uh, we can see that rich countries and Venezuela trading partners, they actually suffer negligible losses in general. So um, we can see from the, um, the top row here that those um, uh, rich countries, they, they do experience losses from Venezuela imports because those values are in red, it means losses. And we can see that those reduction can actually be compensated by increasing the imports from other regions. And this is exactly um, a reflection of our input substitution constraint, um, if you still recall. So uh, we allow regions to compensate their 
um, for example, petrol import losses from Venezuela by increasing petrol imports from other regions. And this is exactly happening here. And specifically for Venezuela allies, the overall change is zero. So again, this is a di direct effect of uh, also our weight setting here um, because, uh, because um, certain transactions between Venezuela and its allies, we uh, assign um, in general high weights, high weighting priority there so that those transactions, they are in general less flexible to vary before and after the disaster. And here we can see that it, uh, Venezuela ally uh, didn't really experience much loss here. Then moving back to Venezuela domestic productions, we can see from, uh, from Paris slides that um, uh, crude oil production loss decline. Uh, sorry, crude oil production declines. And then it has led to um, actually the um, uh, shortages for petrol refining. And these shortages in petrol refining further result in severe shortages at petrol station. And that's exactly what is observed here, marked by the red circle. And this matches exactly the real world consequences mentioned by Manfred, where we do actually uh, observe uh, in the real world cases that uh, petrol shortages occur at Venezuela. And in our and uh, re simulation result here, the relative loss percentage is 51%. And for the food supply, um, so food supply is um, indirectly affected actually through, for example, um, decline in oil and in petrol production, and also in utility electricity generation uh, that is required, for example, for food manufacturing. So that um, here we observe a relative loss of food supply of around 38%. And this corresponds clearly um, to the real world food shortage consequences, also as mentioned by Manfred. And here the color is in orange shown here. So in, in addition to losses, we also observe two revenues. So we can see that um, in the green, here increase. And this is not surprising. Actually, this is exactly as what we expect because um, this is replicating what happens in reality where Venezuela uh, offsets the crude oil uh, export losses by um, actually increasing the food exportation um, specifically to neighboring Colombia. So again, um, this reflects and and um, specifically such blackout is related to drought um, can be felt by almost um, uh, most of the households actually in Venezuela. Here we estimate the um, relative loss of more than 80% um, that, that is resulted from the uh, Venezuela production shortfalls. So in conclusion here, what we observe in terms of the uh, spatial and in terms of the sectoral losses, in general, they match well with the real world crisis in Venezuela. So that is, um, in conclusion, Venezuela domestic transactions suffer the greatest loss. And, and in comparison, rich countries and uh, Venezuela trading partners, uh, their transactions are not much influenced. And there are two good reasons behind this. So firstly, because of the high priority weight settings 
and uh, specifically those rich countries' transactions, uh, those allies' transactions, they are uh, they are aside with high priority weights. Means those transactions are less flexible to vary before and after disaster, and as a result, those losses uh, would. Uh, generally remain low. And secondly, because of the input substitution constraint, uh, those countries, they are able to compensate uh, the losses from Venezuela imports by increasing the imports from other regions. So those are the two regions, uh, two main reasons um, to explain our observation from our model. And we can see that um, placing priority weights is really a game changer uh, regarding the prediction of what could happen for the post disaster economies. And in our work here, uh, we applied um, priority weights ranging from 0 0.1 to 500. And this is, in general, a span of four order of magnitude. And the question here is, if people really place such different priorities or different uh, uh, economic transactions, um, and if the magnitude we adopted here in another study is realistic or not. So in order to answer those two questions, uh, we can actually um, compare priority for different regions to the variability of very similar uh, measures. So here um, we show similar measures, including uh, country level. Um, here it's life uh, insurance premiums, and also um, economic losses and death from COVID-19, um, and average rate for different uh, sectors, and also health expenditure as well for different regions. And here in all those subgraphs, x-axis represents the um, GDP per capita. And so let's start with the top uh, left panel one. It represents um, insurance premium per capita versus GDP per capita for different countries. And here, this measure actually directly reflects the um, uh, perceived people's value of life at different countries. And such values of uh, tens of thousands for rich countries, for rich country citizens, um, and comparing to only um, tens or, or, or hundreds for uh, low income country citizens. There exists variation, and this variation actually um, relating to people's value of life can be really compared to, um, for example, um, priority um, settings, priority difference among uh, transactions. So just like rich country citizens, they tend to have higher value of life, then the related transactions for satisfying their final demand at rich countries, they would naturally be placed at, as, at a higher priority comparing to those at low-income countries. And very similarly, um, here the bottom left panel shows COVID-19 statistics, um, which indicates um, uh, how much economic losses a country or a society um, is willing to accept to avoid a death from COVID-19. And again here, high income countries, for example, New Zealand, a, a death from COVID-19 would be associated with hundred thousands of um, uh, society economic losses. And this value could be just around, um, for, for example, $10 for low income countries. And again, this variation here uh, across different countries would just like priority weighting setting process. For example, uh, for Venezuela, its export to rich countries or to the allies is placing uh, a, a higher priority over their domestic final demand. And seen from the COVID um, death related um, economic losses, we can see that low-income countries, their citizens' death would just sort of not economically important at all. And here, high-income countries, 
they represent more important um, uh, trading partners and therefore their domestic final demand is placed of course with a high priority as well and such trend um, for really exists for other measures as well so those sets of plots they are relating to um, for example for doing the exactly same job at different countries, people are actually paid significantly different. And just very similar to transactions um, as well, where we trade, for example, um, exactly the same product, but uh, for different regions, uh, for different sectors, the priority is different. And again, um, so, in, so Basically, in conclusion here, uh, we can see that um, the range of um, 3.5 magnitude for our transaction um, setting in this work fits actually quite well with the um, other developed um, uh, or uh, like the similar measures for other um, different um, uh, graphs as well. So, um, so that's the point I would like to share regarding uh, why we choose certain magnitude um, in our uh, disaster um, weight priority setting over different transactions. And the final bit is um, sort of re relating to how to interpret uh, the decision weight. And this term itself uh, in generally uh, relates to, for example, uh, decisions uh, by stakeholders, by policymakers about which area of economic activities should be prioritized when facing uh, disaster caused shortages. And especially um, such decision weight would uh, occur at a local scale just shortly after a disaster. And here we notice that in addition to the local decisions, um, if we really consider the spatial relationships among different regions, among different sectors, then such decision weight can also um, come by, for example, geopolitical constellations. For example, international trade relationships relating to uh, geopolitical alliance or um, if certain trade within certain regions are, uh, they are protected, for example, by certain subsidies, by certain tariffs. So in general, uh, we can understand the term decision weights in this proposed method um, in a more generalized way. That means um, it can really combine a certain mechanism that could safeguard or protect um, sectoral and spatial transactions. So those are the main aspects of the study that I would like to share, and we look forward to your comments and questions. Now, um, thank you very much, uh, Manfred and uh, Mengu, for this very interesting and clear presentation. And uh, meanwhile, you have seen that there have been raised a couple of uh, questions. Manfred, have you been able to look at them and can you try to answer them? Most of them are about the weights, which is, of course, what you would, uh, would expect. Yeah, yeah. So um, maybe I'll uh, we'll give Meng you a break and um, I'll, I'll try and deal with those questions. So um, first of all, this is an exposed analysis. Yeah? Uh, this is a, um, a test of a method where we know the real world outcome. Now we know this outcome. We, 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 we test the method by, uh, by putting very few assumptions on those weights. We had only five or six different weights placed on different parts of the world economy. And then we let it go through the optimizer and see whether we can replicate these relatively complex outcomes that are real for Venezuela. Because if we can manage this, then it indicates to us that, that this method would also work ex ante. That means, for example, if in this Venezuela case study, we change the priorities, 
we make Venezuelan households of equal priority to European and North American households. The outcome is very different. Venezuela's losses would not be so high, you know, because other countries would cop more losses. Um, so those weights are assumptions, they're not derived, and they can be used for scenarios. Now, Paul, would you like me to go through the questions in the chat box one by one? If you, yeah, yes, please. Okay. Um, question is, um, um, I hope, uh, yeah, okay. Can we extend the estimate of the disaster between the classes of the population, decrease of the income of the rural population? Um, in principle, yes, if you have that data set. You know, you need a social accounting matrix. They exist for countries where you have income classes distinguished. And then you, absolutely, you can place uh, different, different weights on those income classes, but uh, I do not know that there is a global uh, social accounting matrix that for every country distinguishes income classes. At least I haven't seen it. Next question is, uh, it is not clear to me the database and the weights data. Uh, where did you find the data about the inputs decrease? Is it all inputs or just oil? Is it aggregated data about the weights? Okay, the weights were assumed. This is our scenario. The, in, the input output data comes from the, um, the industrial ecology lab, you know, the database. Um, the scenario, the losses, yeah, they, um, we got them from uh, the events matrix from sources from the web. So uh, the disaster is in fact that Venezuela's oil revenues went down by 75% and electricity went down by 30 something percent. This is just what it is. This is the definition of the scenario. We can't alter this. This is just what the disaster is. We alter and assume different weights. We can play around with the weights. You know? And if we set the weights in an obvious natural way that they think the rich countries, they always secure their supplies, then those results come out and they're quite realistic. You know? We see it in the Kuwait war, you know, the, the rich countries will do anything to secure the oil. So on those transactions, we put a lot of penalty if they are violated. You know? And that leads to this result and this is great. So very, very few uh, assumptions lead to this complex outcome. Next question by Tanya. Could this method of disaster input output analysis be applied to simulating future circular economy scenarios? I imagine the disaster would be a limited global supply chain and input substitution could be for local uh, secondary source from waste. Yes, oh, it's a great idea. I haven't thought about this. This is great. Yeah, it, it, it could be in fact. Yeah, uh, did, we applied the substitution between um, uh, uh, trading partners, yeah? but there's no nothing stopping you from um, uh, in, introducing the substitutability between different commodities. Absolutely, it's a great idea. Uh, next question from Luisa Cojado. Um, thank you for the, this is an exposed or ex ante analysis. Yeah, it's an exposed analysis to see whether the, the method works for an outcome that we know. Now, and that gives us the, an indication of whether we can use it ex ante. You know? um, agents in the economy cannot decide post-disaster output. That is correct. The post-disaster variables are purely the result of the optimizer. We just dial a few different uh, levers and the optimizer just gives us what, what comes out. And if this is, reflects the reality, that indicates that the method works to a reasonable degree. No? Um, yes, we have done a decision. The question, great question. The decision weights are arranged between 0.1 and 500. Have you done a sensitivity analysis? Yes, we have, and it's in the paper that we've submitted. Uh, we didn't have time to show it, uh, but yes, we have. So it's interesting. You can play around with these values and say, what if the world was more equal in its priorities. What if there weren't so many differences between different people doing the same thing? Why are Americans, Europeans worth more than, 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 than people in South America? If that weren't the case, the outcome would be different. And we showed these 
graphs and on paper how the world, how that particular crisis would play out differently if the priorities had been different. Um, and also, yeah, the next question, had the priority rate been the same as before the disaster? We've done that too. We've actually simulated the Sting method and made all decision weights equal. So insensitive of any priorities. We also present this in the paper. We've just today submitted the paper that has a few additional results. Again, um, a question from Tanya. Could you explain more the assumptions or justifications behind input substitution? In a supply chain disruption, for example, how do we know if a neighboring country could substitute the temporary material scarcity? This is something to do with the decision weights. No, that's not to do with the decision weights. The decision weights are purely about priorities. The input substitution uh, constraint is handled very differently by another substitution matrix where you put in your assumptions about what are perfect substitutes. And again, it's up to you to decide. We made no commodities perfect substitutes because it's an aggregate analysis. So you cannot substitute mining with forestry. But we said, um, you know, food from North America is the same as food from Europe if it is imported into Venezuela or anywhere else. Yeah, we thought that was a reasonable assumption, but of course you can debate this and you can do anything different in this. You can define different substitutability. With uh, Colombia, uh, I'll make just some point of uh, qualifications. So the people who, who, who sold the food to Colombia were private people. The government didn't want that. The government said the, the prices are frozen and you should sell your food to the Venezuelan people at those prices, but of course they didn't want to because they couldn't make any profits. So it was actually smuggled across the border. That, that picture with those cars with the boots full of food. That's And um, so that's a spatial aspect here because the border between Venezuela and Colombia is relatively open. Venezuela is only bordered by Brazil in the south, but there's this big jungle in between. There's, there's lots of rainforest between and, the, and, the, and it's not very easy to trade across that border. And to the east is Guyana, similarly, there's, there's no road across the border to Guyana. So all the food was sold to Colombia. And so that border was very loose. And so it's a flexible transaction. It's very loose. That wasn't controlled. The government did not, couldn't do anything to prevent this. Yeah? It's a flexible. Yeah? If we had had the border to Brazil set flexible, we would have seen food sold to Brazil. But spatially, that border is not accessible. And those were all the questions. I hope I've given you a reasonable answer. I have one additional question about this constraint number five. Isn't it because you call it a constraint, but it seems to me that you try to relax this constraint compared to previous studies. You said, okay, uh, we now also allow for input substitution. <clears throat> so it's more, more or less a relaxation of a constraint compared to previous studies. Yeah, well, the previous studies, there was no constraint. They had an A matrix, like Steiner, Bert Steiner, he's got an A matrix with constant coefficients. And then he imposes his events matrix with the gamma. The gammas come from him, the idea with the gammas come from him. Uh, and then he, and it's all very rigid, you know, everything mm. goes down and, and the losses are much, much higher. Yeah, because you can't substitute, yeah, because you ask that this food shall come from Europe where it could come from somewhere else. Mm. Yeah, but maybe you should sell it not as a constraint, but as a, uh, uh, yeah, ah, I yeah, I see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. It's a relaxation <laughs> of a harder constraint that would be there otherwise. Yes, you're correct. Yeah. Mm. Mengu, do you uh, meanwhile, um, because Manfred already answered the questions, but do you want to add something? And other, meanwhile, the, the listeners can, uh, given the time, raise their, send their final question because we need to stop over five minutes or something. But here's Mengi. Yep, so uh, I think I just have maybe one quick point that is um, this method is more like um, a, a plan form itself. It has different ability um, that could be really applied to solve um, diff like issues in different research field itself and also covering also different uh, spatial 
um, like different regions uh, should heal. <laughs> so it, it's sort of like the um, um, a platform itself enables different uh, thoughts, different combinations and specific case studies. So that's the point I'd like to say here. Okay, well, then there is uh, I, uh, still an opportunity to raise one final question. Uh, yeah, there's a question from Umid. Uh, what is the role of prices in such an approach? Uh, it's none. It's a short term. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a short term, the immediate how, how the immediate uh, loss from a disaster ripple through. It's just like uh, uh, Bert's, Bert's approach or the uh, inoperability model. Um, uh, so prices do not play a role here uh, because it's short term. Having said this, there are approaches where price, prices do play a role and computable general equilibrium models, CGE models, have been applied to disaster analysis. That, of course, that should be mentioned and uh, that's uh, where pro prices do play a role when they adjust in a sort of more uh, a longer term perspective. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, it seems that uh, all the questions have been raised that there are no, and <laughs> no, no question is uh, left. Uh, again, Manfred and Mengu, uh, um, thank you for this very interesting presentation. I found it very clear. Um, uh, input output analysis is not my main area, but still I could follow everything and I'm, I, I understand what you're doing. So uh, I'm also looking forward to, uh, to the paper uh, so that that spatial economic analysis can uh, publish it soon and then everybody can uh, uh, read this, uh, uh, yeah, more carefully. I would, I would like to thank all the listeners for their questions, and hopefully you found it interesting as well. But given the reactions that I saw, most people were quite enthusiastic. So, so uh, I think it's time that we uh, close the session and continue where, wherever you are, late in the evening or early in the morning. <laughs> okay, bye bye. Thank you for right. having me. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.